What happened Janie. to Mary? Y'all were alive, bro. Janie, you're Nobody's drawing. I didn't know. Oh my god. Nobody's even watching it. It's okay. Oh, bitch. Mama, girl, somebody asked my question after this, Liza. What question? What I just said. He's, look, he's saying you said. What's popping, y'all? He said what's popping, y'all. I don't know if he's on this yet. I'm on it. I'm on it. I don't like. Ew, fucking Rob. I'm leaving. Who? <laughs> fucking Rob. He said anybody to everybody. All right, Julia, bye. That's why you're not even going to be in it now. Shut up. I didn't even want to be in it. All right. That's why you're not going to be in it now. This is how you draw a penis. I'm probably just gonna go back to Miss Shellhammers after this, then, actually. That's what we were gonna do. That's what I was gonna do. Alright. Bitch, you better stop. Jane, knock it off. Trying to get people. Alright, now nobody's watching because of y'all. Thanks. <laughs> and what happened to the freaking filter y'all draw? <laughs> I know, it made me look dark. Tuka's watching. Hey, yo, what's poppin'? Yo. <laughs> what's poppin', baby? <laughs> I definitely, ha I definitely had this pimple the last time we went live, which was uh, two weeks ago. That same pimple. Does anybody have a charger? Does anybody have a charger? Yeah, Jamie, Jamie does. She's using it. Jamie. I don't have it. I didn't bring it. Wait, so what are y'all doing after this? I'm, I'm going, going to be lunch. That's where That's I told cool. my homeroom I was going. So why would we do this in the first place? Hey, Kendra. My dog. LaFair. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I remember I met him at Hershey Park. What's up, my boy? Oh, okay. come over here. Yo. Hey, Jamie. You would think I'm stupid. You would say I'm really a dumb. I don't want none of your love. I can name my love. You told me it's crazy because I really gave my trust. But if I don't really know the rest of it, since stop singing. Break up banks. I thought I knew that. Hold on, wait, bitch. Hold on, bitch. About to be a little cool. Wait, let me see what you let me see what your glasses are. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> I look like a nerd. You look like a bad bitch. Yo, she's I'm a bad drawing. Bitch, fuck the bitch. So bitch get sick, I'ma cut the bitch. I'm a bad bitch. Suck some dick. If the, the bitch, bitch gets sick, sick, I'll cut the, the bitch. bitch. I'll cut up the bitch. I'll, I'll gut the, the bitch. I'll cut the fuck up the bitch, man. Yeah. Fuck the bitch. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Clary here with ABC 27 News. We are on the grounds of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. And just behind me, a body was discovered this morning. Harrisburg police say the 18-year-old man was robbed at gunpoint, then shot and killed before being dumped at a local park. The murder happening at a reservoir park near the National Civil War Museum in Susquehanna Township. Harrisburg police arresting Tyrese Randolph and Nathaniel Acevedo. Court documents show Dorshak's body was found at Reservoir Park near a parking lot by the National Civil War Museum in Susquehanna Township. Police say Randolph and Acevedo robbed Dorshak at gunpoint in the first block of Thomas Street before forcing him into the trunk of his own car. According to police, Acevedo then shooting Dorshak twice in the face while he was still in the trunk. Court documents show the pair then abandoned the vehicle and returned the next day before dumping his lifeless body near the museum's parking lot. According to police, they linked Randolph and Acevedo to Dorshak's stolen debit card used to shop at the Harrisburg Mall, Choice Tobacco Outlet, and Sheets. In a statement from Dorshak's family, they wrote in part, our family cannot put into words how truly devastated we are to lose our sweet Torin. He was the light in every room and always knew how to put a smile on anyone's face, adding this senseless act should not happen to anyone, nor should any family have to go through this pain. This proves that violence can happen to anyone and how a moment in time can change the lives of so many. We will never forget him and will love him forever. My name is Heather. I am Torin's mother. Torin was born on December 6th, 2000. And actually, there's kind of a funny story about that because I had a scheduled C-section and 
I was actually scheduled for December 5th so that Torin and his oldest sister Kelsey did not have the same birthday because I didn't want them to have to share. So we went to the hospital on the 5th to have him, but the lab results that I did the day before to make sure that he was ready to be born got misplaced, so they weren't ready. So I had to come back the next day so that they had the same birthday. And at that point, I was doing it by myself. He was my third child. And the day that he was born, his biological dad was in Dauphin County Prison. And I had my best friend's mother, Judy, with me, who was my, my rock through the entire pregnancy, as well as the day that he was born. My name is Judith Banks Bomback, and um, Heather is my daughter's, oldest daughter's best friend. And they've been friends um, since high school, and I consider her a daughter by another mother. My name is Kesey, and Heather and I have been best friends since our freshman year in high school. We're 43 now, so that's 29 years. I was actually in the delivery room for two of Heather's children, her first one, Michaela, and then Torn, which was a, um, uh, a se section. I can't think, I can't think of the word. C, C section. Couldn't think of the word. Um, and um, it was a real special moment because I remember talking to Heather and she's telling me she can't breathe and the nurses are saying, if she's talking to you, tell her she can breathe, she can breathe. And so I remember them asking me, did I want to look under the sheet? And I said, no, I'll wait till he's born. And it was just wonderful hearing that, that, that cry and, and the just wonderful look on Heather's face to see her little boy. All my children's biological dad, um, all four of them, we actually met, we worked together. And he, at the time that I met him, he was very, very godly. Um, he didn't do anything wrong at that point. He was very convincing to me. I was young. I had just come out of a re long-term relationship. Um, and he is actually 14 years older than I am. So I trusted him. And we started a relationship um, shortly after our oldest came, Michaela, And then we had Kelsey 18 months after that. And then... Torn came along, and then Quinn, um, she was our baby. So we had four small children. Um, he was in and out of prison the entire time um, because he has older children. And um, he was in and out for child support because he would go back and forth with jobs. He would work a job and then quit and then get behind on support and then they would come and they would pick him up. Um, so not only was I juggling four children, I was also having to run him back and forth to work when he was at work release and I would go every Saturday or Sunday and take him grocery shopping and I had to pretty much take care of him at that point. I watched her be the strongest person I've ever met and she did a lot on her own. She put up with a lot and she uh, just I mean, she had Michaela when we were 21, and then Kels, and then Torin, and then Quinn. And so by the time we were 30, she had four children. And she's amazing. I don't, there's, I don't know what else I can say other than she's literally the strongest person I've ever met. When the kids were small, um, I was very naive, and I didn't realize that... Um, he was also a drug addict. Um, he really didn't do it in the house. He didn't do it when we were home. Um, most of the time he would um, leave after the kids and I would go to bed and um, he'd be out all night and then come back in the morning. Um, there were lots of times where he would come back in the morning um, and he had stolen my debit card overnight and taken all of our money. Um, 
and would even run all the gas out of my car. So sometimes I was going to gas, I was going to work with just a little tiny bit of gas. Um, so it just got to the point where his drug habit really started to pick up and um, we used to argue a lot about that, about the fact that he was taking our money and my bank account was always negative and it was a struggle just to get the basic needs for the for the children they were they were babies and um, it just got to the point where I just had enough and realized that this was not a life that the kids needed to have. I remember him more than my siblings. Um, I did have somewhat of a relationship with him so for a while when he was coming in and out of our lives it affected me more because I did have a little bit of a relationship with him whereas my younger siblings were like no he doesn't mean anything to us so I don't really remember my relationship with him as in like I have a bunch of memories with him but I remember like he's still my dad. That's when we, my mom agreed to buy the home so that we could have a stable home. It was hard for her to raise those four kids uh, that's why I went out and bought a house so that we could all live together, her and her four kids. Once we moved into the home um, in Middletown, we then, um, everything started to change. Um, however, financially, it was still difficult for me because even though my mom was helping, we were still splitting the bills. Even even though my mom did kind of take the brunt of it, you know, because I still had daycare to pay for um, and things like, and expenses just for the kids. Um, so she was actually very helpful with that. Um, I got no financial assistance from, from their dad. Um, and then I started to like myself again and I started to be a better person again because he destroyed me. Um, he, even though he wasn't physically abusive, he was emotionally abusive. So the kids and I actually had our life back um, after years of being oppressed. And um, I started dating and I actually met my husband Chris at work and um, we started a relationship and now we are married. Um, and he took on four children, even though he has two of his own. So we have six all together. I, I knew about it. Like I knew what I was, for lack of a better term, getting into. Um, I mean, like I said, we were kind of friends here and there and we had you know mutual friends and I knew the data wasn't in the picture. I just, didn't know like a lot of the intricacies on why but I mean once I you know proceeded to want to be with her I, I knew you know it was a package deal it wasn't just Heather it was Heather it was Michaela Torn Kelsey and Quinn and, and then you also had kids of yes and I had kids of my own Dylan and Allison and you know that was another thing I just I wanted to make sure you know going in that it would, you know, it'd be a good fit for everybody. There were a few times where um, their father would come and try to visit um, at the house. It hasn't been for several years. Um, I had never pushed him away from the kids. Um, I always let it be their choice and they chose not to have anything to do with him and Torin I think felt probably betrayed the most because of him being the only boy. Um, and he, even though he had the father figure in Chris, I still think that it was more hurtful for him that he wasn't around. Um, but I think after Chris and Torin bonded, I think then he realized that that is what a dad is supposed to be and they just didn't want to have anything to do with him anymore. As he got older, you know, he was always, he wanted to do stuff with his friends. He was always wanting to try to, you know, get a job. 
and make money and, you know, work on his cars. So I wasn't really, like, hounding him or constantly, like, around him, but I was always there for him. If he had any problems or any, you know, had any, needed anyone to talk to, I'd be there for him. But I wouldn't try to be in his business constantly, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Or, you know, so. Chris came into the picture, and, of course, the kids were hesitant at first. Um, they kind of liked it just being me and their Grammy and them. Um, but they quickly, they quickly adjusted to him being there, and they um, learned to start relying on him and start treating him like a dad. Um, he was very active in their after-school activities. Um, he actually started the girls playing softball. He actually helped coach their softball teams. Um, that at that point, I couldn't afford for them to do any extracurricular activities. Um, so that was something that they were always very grateful for, for him coming in and actually stepping up and taking the time and spending the time with them and teaching them how to do things. We're sorry to say that the last thing stopped, so we're gonna make it up with big bump. Torin growing up was always so silly. He always was laughing. He always was dancing. He always was singing. Um, he would just, as soon as he'd get home from school, he was just full of energy. He, you know, would do his homework. He would be responsible, but he just was always just, you know, doing this and doing that and just always acting so silly. Um, it didn't really change much in his teenage years. He was the same way. Hey, get it. Shoot, shoot that. Oh, okay, 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 excitable but he wasn't obnoxious he liked everything to be just perfect uh, that was his looks his clothes now he had his own style and his own taste but within that he everything had to be perfect you could always tell Torin was home because you could hear him singing in his room it was that loud and it's like because I my room is directly below his and you know me and my sister would always be like I wonder if Torin saw him be like a couple like like 20 minutes later be like oh yeah he is because you could hear him singing like he would sing it could be like the like 11 o'clock at night you would hear him singing or like early in the morning yes I do I believe the one day I will be where I was right there right next to you and it's hard the days just seem so dark the moon the stars, nothing without you. Your touch, your skin, where do I begin? No words can explain the way I'm missing you. The night, this emptiness, this holding on inside. These tears, they tell their own story. Told me not to cry when you were gone. But the feelings overwhelm me It's much too strong Can I lay by your side Next to you Take care of you. I don't want to be here if I can't be with you tonight. Torrin would make songs about every situation. It didn't matter what was happening, he would make a song about it. And it was always, the song was always kind of like a parody as well. 
like he would just pick something random um, that might have been going on like a car a loud car might have been driving by and he would just make something like oh did you hear that car you know what I mean it would just be random and he would just make some kind of the ending was always some kind of joke and then he would end up giggling when it was done that was his biggest talent I think was to uh, be the joke or be the the funny one but there were times where they actually would the four of them would get a beat together and, and actually he would sing and they would have a good beat and they would kind of do backup singing and they would pick up things in the house and, and make random music and, and he would always be like, ah, oh, you guys aren't doing that right. You know, he would even throw that into the song. He'd be like, oh, my sisters can't sing and, you know, things like that. He would do all kinds of, he would just ad lib everything. When we were younger, um, Quentin and I, we would like do little performances in the kitchen and like the way our kitchen is like over here we have the counters and over here like there's a counter and then like a window. So we'd always pretend the window was like where we would perform. So we'd all like, um, i will put music on my phone and then we would dance that music and we would like have like a competition, like a dancing competition. And then like when each of us, after each of us would perform, um, we'd all like go like on the side of the stage and um, we'd be like, okay, who won? Who did better? And then Torn would be like, uh, I don't think you did or I think I was the best. And then Quinn and Torn would always argue because Quinn thought she was better, but Torn thought he was better. So We did not get along as kids at all. Um, me being the youngest, you know, I would always try to fit in with all the older kids, but, you know, it was always them three <laughs> but you know I would see Torn do something and I would just follow right behind him but it wasn't until we were older till we actually started getting along. The girls used to do all kinds of things to him they would uh, you know try to put things in his hair paint his toenails um, they would do all kinds of things to him um, but they they would fight they um, especially him and Quinn would get really rowdy sometimes, and then they would they would fight. Um, and then the one time I actually made them wear, I, I had a big oversized t-shirt, and I actually made them both wear it and sit on the couch with this oversized t-shirt on it. It was, I called it the get along shirt, um, so that they, and, and they hated it. They, they hated it, but I actually think it did them good because they have, they have a special bond. Um, and, I, and I kept saying, you know, along the line when the relationship did change in the teenage years, I kept saying it was because of that shirt, you know, or I'd make them hold hands if I didn't have the shirt readily available. But um, they would fight, but it was never, it was never physical. Um, they would argue. Um, they always had to, you know, sometimes Torin would have to get the last word, but um, overall they were very loving towards each other and very supportive. I was always kind of the babysitter of Torin and Quinn, <laughs> and so I grew up kind of teaching them and really watching them grow up. So I think it was at a young age that's what I've done and then kind of just carried on, that on through the years. My biggest argument with Torin was that I was always, I wasn't his mother so <laughs> that's always his quote to me was that I wasn't his mother so I always kind of took on that role of taking care of him, watching over him and sometimes he liked it, sometimes he didn't. <laughs> I actually figured out that he was performer material when he was very little because he used to just sing around the house all the time. Um, he did in elementary school, he did readers theater um, and he generally always had the lead role and he just was amazing at every role that he did. Um, so when he told me that he wanted to start singing and he wanted to be famous, I wasn't surprised at all because I, I, I knew. I, he just has, had that charisma, he had that passion. Um, even though I tried to keep him realistic, I really had every 
gut feeling that he really could have did something with it. I remember him being so loving and compassionate because Heather couldn't raise anything other than a loving and compassionate child because that's the way she is. Um, he was talented. He was uh, just the way he dressed, the way he carried himself. I thought he could be a model. He could be a spokesperson, uh, you know, for some kind of product. I mean, I, I think he was just amazing. I remember that his mother bought him a coat, which he gave away, a nice coat that he, he, he said he lost it, but I think he gave it to somebody because that's the kind of kid he was. Somebody probably needed one. Uh, he had an iPad and he gave that to another kid because he had a phone and the other kid didn't have anything, so he gave him his iPad. Yeah, so that's just the kind of giving kid he was. He, anybody that didn't have anything he wanted them to have, he would share. I always am helping people with the next motherfucking thing. If anybody, I never say fucking no. People are always asking me like, oh, Soren, can you do this for me? And I barely ever say no. The only reason why I'm not, if I, if I say no, bro, I'm either busy or I'm at work or I'm doing some shit because they, they be asking me for rides. And people like, people were like, yo, Oh, people using me, da, 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 da. let them use me, bruh. Because at the end of the day, I know I was being a real person. At the end of the day, I know I was doing something for somebody. And I was doing a good deed for a motherfucking person who probably doesn't even fuck with me. But at the end of the day, it don't fucking matter. I always talk to Torn about people using him. I used to tell him every day. Um, I knew what he went through. And I knew that half the people he claimed as his friend and half the people that now claim him as their friend were part of the bullying too, or part of the making fun of. And if it wasn't like currently in, you know, over the past few years, it was definitely in middle school. So like, I just think Torn got too caught up into wanting everybody to be his friend. Mm. I think the bullying started actually in middle school. Um, I noticed that his, he had some, a group of friends for um, a few years and I noticed that he stopped being around them and I kind of questioned it. I'm like, why are you not hanging out with this person anymore? And why are you not spending time with this person anymore? And he kind of was just he was very vague with his answers. Um, so I kind of knew that something was going on. Um, his reasonings just didn't make sense. So I'd start to question things. He wasn't going places as much as what he was doing. So it, it seemed like he was kind of becoming more of a homebody um, for a little bit. So I kind of suspected that things were, were not what they used to be. Um, and then he would talk to me about it, but he would never go in a lot of detail. Um, I didn't find out some things um, people were saying on uh, social media from him. I actually heard it from other people um, that, that I am friends with, that their children went to school with Torin. Um, and when I approached him with it, he would beg me not to do anything about it. Um, because he just didn't want to make things worse. And as a mom, that was the toughest thing because he was coming home, he was hurting every day. Ever since I started middle school, sixth grade, that's when it started getting worse. And I'm a senior in high school now. And I go through it every day. And I'm just so exhausted. I just want to, I want to I graduate. It makes me mad at myself, bro. It makes me so mad because I feel every single time I don't let I use when stuff comes up like when stuff comes up I just I just ignore I try to ignore it but when I it's that just keeps reoccurring in my brain and I just like yo like why do people think these things of me and I need some help like I need I don't want to I don't want to say that I got a problem because I don't have a problem because I'm very I have my I keep my he head high but I just need, like, I need someone to sit here and be like, because I can't, I feel like I can't even vent to people anymore because I feel like, one, I don't want to seem like I'm sad. Two, 
being sad is very like boring like i don't want i don't like that bad energy but i just i just i don't know what i need bro like i need i just i need a break i need a break bro like i wish i can't wait to graduate i cannot gra wait to graduate because i need to distance myself from like the people because it does this is nuts i can turn around Every single time I turn around, I see somebody who had a problem with me just because I'm bi gay, bi, whatever, yo. It don't even matter at this point. Like, it's just, it's just tiring. And I try to be the best person I can be, and I just, it just doesn't work. Like, I feel every time I try so hard. And I just try to be nice to everybody. I just try to keep the peace. I try to like, like I don't, I'm not good at confrontation. Like I'm really not. When people like say stuff, I'm like, I like back up a little bit. I just, I just need some advice for a fro. But um, bye y'all. Uh... It actually came to a head. Um, he actually, at some point, said that he wanted to harm himself. And I got a phone call from the school, and I um, went and picked him up, and we went to the crisis center in, up in Harrisburg, and he talked to a counselor up there. Um, and that was very concerning, because I, I didn't realize he was at that low point, because he I had never seen that side of him. Because when he came home, even though he was home all the time, he was still typical Torrin. You know, he was still himself. He was still, you know, making the jokes and, and do things. Um, he did spend a lot more time in his bedroom. Um, but, you know, he always said he was doing homework or he was writing music or, you know, playing, the rare occasion, playing a video game. So I never became real overly concerned until, until it came to a head. And then at that point, I had to, him and I had to really start to face what was going on. A lot of people bullied him because of his sexuality. And when he came out to the world, everybody looked at him differently. And um, that's the only reason I could think of of why nobody would like him. Uh, I remember back in eighth grade, we had an eighth grade formal dance and something happened the situation with another group of boys and Torin wasn't able to stay the rest of the dance because of the bullying going on. So it happened a lot in middle school and then up to high school it started to get even worse I believe especially after you know coming out about his sexuality and what he prefers people didn't really take that well. Um, but he was a very strong person, and he knew how to handle it. So. Nobody fucking understands the shit I go through on, the mother on a daily basis. Motherfuckers really hate me just because of how I was made. But I hate people who say that being gay is a choice because I wish every motherfucking day that I was straight. I'd be, look I'd be like, yo, why the fuck? Why, can't, why do it gotta be me? Why can't I be fucking straight, bruh? I wish, I, I swear to God, I wish every day I'd be like, yo, I wish I was straight. I wish I did not have to go through this. I wish I had another motherfucking struggle other than this because everybody motherfucking hating on Torn because I'm gay, right? I didn't even come out on my own. I was fucking exposed. I came out forcefully on April 17th, two years ago, bro. Torn wasn't, Torn didn't come out on his own. He was outed. I remember it was a day during the summer, someone texted me about it and sent me pictures that people posted on Facebook about him being with some guy. Somebody did post a picture of him and a guy that he was talking to and dating. Most people didn't know it was a secret. I knew who it was because he had showed me prior. Um, when he, when that happened and the picture dropped on Facebook, Torrin had deactivated all of his, all of his accounts. He turned off his phone. And I remember calling Torrin and calling him, blowing up his phone, texting him, trying to see, make sure he was okay. Because I know 
how it can get and I know how touring can be. That 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 being revealed came out and that kind of took a toll on his self-esteem and what really made him, you know, start feeling some type of way about everything. So everybody seen it, everybody was sharing it, everybody was posting about it, but they didn't like realize how it affected him or how he felt or what he had to do with. Torrin being bisexual and gay was, um, I guess I did kind of always, I knew. Um, I mean, he had girlfriends and things like that in elementary school and middle school, but it was never a relationship. Um, and he did get bullied for that because there was a point where he wasn't sure what he wanted. And he was just trying to explore and try to figure himself out. And what he was bullied and what had happened was, you know, some of his friends that he used to spend a lot of time with that I was referencing earlier um, were popular kids. They were into sports and, you know, Torrin started to, even though he liked sports, he wasn't as athletic. Um, he's, he started to ask questions and try to find himself and... Um, they were automatically picking up on that and just assumed that he was gay without him actually admitting it at that point. And whether they were homophobic or not, I'm not sure, um, but they kind of unfriended him at that point. And that was part of, I started to realize too that there was something more to all of this than than just, you know, a couple kids not getting along anymore. He knew that we, that would make no difference to us whatsoever. We loved him no matter what, so. Torn was bashed a lot because he always tried to cover it up at first just to make other people, I guess, happy and comfortable. I know like, for boys, like boys wise, um, they never wanted to be his friend afterwards knowing that he was gay because they said he, they didn't feel comfortable around him. Even though Torn was never like that and would never do anything to make you feel uncomfortable. So I feel it was more as like because Torn walked around with a mask on for years and then out of nowhere he came out and said that he was bisexual. At first, he didn't really tell me a lot too much about it. He just talked about him being confused and everything. And, you know, I just told him whatever it is, just, you know, don't be afraid what other people got to think about it. Torin went to Florida um, his junior year. Um, he went there because he wanted a break from here. And it was more so the bullying. Like, I think that they had just completely diminished his soul. Like, he just, he wasn't feeling the best about himself. He wasn't, um, he had friends, but he wasn't, he just wasn't as connected as what he should have been. And you know, he approached me, he actually approached his grandmother first, the one that he lived with, um, which is his biological dad's mother. And um, he talked to her about it and she agreed to it. And then um, they came up for a visit. We all sat down, we discussed it. And as a mother, um, of course, I didn't want him to be gone for an entire year. Um, you know, I missed him terribly, but I completely understood why he wanted to get away and he had an opportunity to do that and you know um, I think all of us at some point in our life 
some things had happened that we would want to get away and didn't have the opportunity to do that. And so he had that opportunity and I didn't want to take that from him. Um, so he went there and um, he came back, uh, he came back refreshed. He came back himself again. Um, he had some really close friends down there and I think he actually got to be himself down there and he didn't have to pretend to be something like he was here. Um, down there he was already, you know, Torin, Torin Dvorak, the, you know, the gay kid or, you know, where up here he wasn't able to be what he wanted to be or what he was. was all about getting ready for big events. Um, he was really excited about prom and he loved to get fancy. He, he wanted to be different. He wanted to be flashy. Um, I couldn't believe when he um, sent me the link of the prom jacket that he wanted. I must have asked him like five times before I ordered it. I'm like, are you sure you want this jacket? Because it just seems so flashy to me. He's like, yes, mom, that's what I want. And he actually was supposed to go to prom with somebody else, but they bought their dress and it wasn't going to match his jacket. So he said that he wasn't going with them anymore because it wasn't going to match his jacket and he didn't want to, he didn't want to change his jacket choice. Um, so he was very set on that jacket and um, he sent me the link and he's like, mom, order these, me, order me these shoes. And I'm like, they have spikes on them, Torin. And he's like, mom, I love these shoes. I just, I love these shoes. And again, I was like, I kept, I kept putting it off because I was hoping he changed his mind because even though I loved him being him and I loved him being flashy, I was just always in the back of my head. I'm always afraid of what the bullies are going to say and what they're going to bring back for him because he had, he had come so far with not letting that stuff bother him anymore. And so I'm just like, are you sure you want to bring this attention to yourself? And he's like, mom, I love these shoes. So we got the shoes and they matched perfectly with the jacket. We were in this big group chat and my friend Cece wanted to invite Torn and it was a bit of an issue with some of the people within the group chat because of outside issues that they had but all in all we ended up being able to go together and we all met at the Capitol in Harrisburg and just took our group photos and we're all together. On prom night Torn came in we all walked in this was like 15 minutes into prom I had called Torn because I was like where's Torn like I don't see him anywhere you know, like prom didn't even start, the music didn't even start playing yet. It was, we were eating first. I called him and I was like, Torin, where are you? And he was like, uh, I left. And I was like, why did you leave? Like prom just started. He was like, I just don't feel comfortable there. Like nobody likes me. None of the friends I had like me anymore. So I just felt out of place and I felt like I had to leave. I know that um, he had gotten to some arguments with like some of his closest friends from Middletown. It was me, Danny, Julia, and we were all close. And we always spent every day together after school. If we didn't have work, we was always together. So the one time we had a disagreement and we all got into an argument and everything just blew out of proportion. And we just blocked each other out. We didn't talk to each other. I remember him. He texted me as sweet about how he missed me and stuff. But I wasn't trying to hear it because we always got no arguments. But it was like this time. I didn't want to go back this time. So I didn't text him back. He just said, he just kept writing me, and then he, he just kept saying, I miss you, best friend. He said, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. He said, I know I messed up. 
I just didn't say nothing to him. Graduation, I was nervous because he, even though as a child and even in, you know, his freshman year, up until his freshman year, he was brilliant in his, in all his testing, um, you know, he was always proficient. He was advanced um, in, in one year in his, I believe it was mathematics, he was like almost to the very top of the bar in his testing. He was he was extremely smart, but of course in high school, with everything that was going on, um, he got a little lazy with his, his academics. Um, and so, of course, I was a little concerned his senior year that he wasn't actually going to graduate even though he the entire time, mom, you're worrying about nothing. I'm fine. My grades are fine. And they were, and I, and I, I followed them, but I was just always had like in the back of my head, are we going to get to the end of May? And they're going to say, Oh wait, you don't have enough credits or you don't have enough of this to graduate. Um, so actually when he came home with the, with the cap and gown for graduation, I was actually very relieved because I was like, oh, they gave it to you, so we're good. Like, we're golden, you know? Um, but he, he was nervous, but he was just, I think he was so excited to, to go on the next step of his journey. Um, but I think he was kind of nervous, too, because he was now going to have to be an adult. And um, I think it was, he had mixed emotions. I had actually, I had gotten a part-time job. Um, I work 40 plus hours at my full-time job and I had gotten a part-time job um, in the evenings to work 20 plus hours as well. And I had just started it. I had only been there three weeks. Um, and the reason I did that was so that the kids, you know, we both have, my husband and I both have good incomes, but having six kids, um, five car payments, insurance, you know, eight cell phones, it's expensive and, you know, plus mortgage and, and bills. And, um, my kids have never been deprived for Christmas. Um, but it gets harder every year to give them a good Christmas. And this year I wanted to give them a good Christmas. Um, I had, you know, goals to do that. Plus I also, um, we wanted to pay off Torin's um, car because he wanted something different. He wanted um, a Chevy Impala is um, what he wanted because we had just bought Quinn a car in June and he was a little bummed because he got the hand-me-down car and she got to get the car, you know, the new car, even though it wasn't new, new to her. Um, so the deal was that if he would get a full-time job and help pay off the car that he had, that he, we would help him get whatever he wanted. And um, so in order for him to do that, to, for him, me to help him do that, I got this part-time job for Christmas and to help get that car paid off quicker so that he could get what he wanted, um, so that he wasn't shorted. And um, so I was actually working that night that everything happened. And um, so I didn't see him that night. He had dinner with everybody else um, except for my husband who wasn't home yet. And, um, and then he, he left probably about 15 minutes before I got home from my second job. Um, I work during the day and I drive out to Ohio and I came back and it was, a, I was making something to eat. Then he came down the stairs and he said, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm going out to Ari's house. Um, I'll be back in a little bit. You know, I wasn't sure, you know, if he said, you know, I usually say bye, love you, or have fun, or, you know, behave, or something like that. And then he just, you know, he walked out the door, and I continued making dinner. Torin would hang out in the city if he was prompted to do so. Um, 
He didn't often leave that late though. Usually if he was going there, he would leave earlier in the evening. Like he would leave right after dinner or, and, and most of the time he said he was going to Ariana's or he'd say Ari's, um, he called her Ari. Um, I believed him, you know, um, she had a, she has a baby and he would say like he goes and he would tell me that he goes up, you know, to hang out with her because she can't really go a whole lot of places with a baby. And I know that he would, he would help by taking her to work and things. Um, so I never really gave him a hard time when he said he was going to Ariana's. Um, and even though I wasn't home that night, that's where he told my husband that he was, he said he was going to Ariana's. Um, and he didn't question it because, as I mentioned, we, we never questioned him going there um, because we knew of her and we knew that he was going someplace relatively safe. Our friendship really meant a lot to me. Like, I came to him about everything. He was really my only friend in school um, when I was pregnant. Um, he went and bought my baby, my baby some stuff. Um, he would always um, stay the night at my house if it was late, and he would leave in the morning and go home. Um, he really helped me get through school. If I needed transportation back and forth to like appointments or just to go to the store or anything, he was always right there with me. Me and Torin actually hung around Tyrese a couple of times. Um, he did tell me that they they've been friends for like maybe like a year or so. They um, they've been you know it's always been um, social like you know they met on social media I'm assuming. Um, so you know they they've been friends for a minute. He never I never heard him mention Nate to me. Um, so maybe Nate I don't know if he ever was really friends with Nate, but Tyrese he he did have a friendship with him. My name is Dennis Early. Um, I've been driving bus probably like eight years now. Um, I enjoy b driving. You know, I do um, special need kids. Uh, that day started out where I was running a little late, and uh, I usually say a prayer before I, 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 you know, drive the bus. That way, I don't hurt any of the kids or hurt anyone, pretty or myself. Right. Uh, but that day, I was running late. I didn't say a prayer before I left. So uh, I had to get my first student at 6.30 in the morning. So I, I was probably got there at probably 6.35. And then I picked her up, um, and we headed towards the school. To, well, headed towards someone else's house to pick up, and I picked them up. And where she lives at is on the other side of Reservoir Park. So if I cut through Reservoir Park, I can make up the five minutes instead of going through the city again. So I decided to uh, make, make up time and drive up the, through Reservoir Park. And as I started up there, we were up there singing and the sun was up, it was beautiful. It was a, it was a beautiful day, warm and uh, like I said, we were singing because we had, we had the radio on and they loved to sing in the mornings. 
And uh, so what happened was uh, we coming around the corner and we reached the top of the reservoir. And then I was there earlier that yesterday, the day before I was there. And um, it was beautiful. Every morning you go up there and to see the sunrise is beautiful. So we're riding up there the day before. I didn't see anything over to the right. So the day I found Torrin, I was driving up there. And as I got to the top of the hill, which is near the last parking lot on the right, um, I saw a blanket. It was, it was um, a blanket there. And... As I drove by it, I was like, man, why do people throw the trash out like that in, in this beautiful area? And as I drove by, I looked like I saw a head with legs, and I'm like, whoa. Turned my bus into the parking lot. As I did, I came towards the back end of Torin. And so I just saw the back of his head with the blankets. And I blew the horn at him, you know, twice, and he, he didn't move. So uh, I called 911, asked 911 if, uh, or if they could send someone out here. I think there's an unconscious guy out here. 911 dispatch said, uh, can you see his face? And I said, no, I can't see it, but I can move my bus to it to see, the, see his face, and as soon as I adjusted my bus in front of him, I could see blood all over his face. His face was red, it, it wasn't like he was white, it was red. And I said, oh, to the dispatcher, probably freaked out a little, seeing a dead guy, you know, um, that early in the morning. So, um, it definitely, it definitely set me back. It kind of scared me a little. So, the dispatcher kept me, kept me on the phone, told me to stay there until the first responders got there. I I stayed, but in the meantime, I'm thinking this guy could be in the woods that just did this to Torn, he could be in the woods because the blood was still fresh. It was still, it was like it was just, just happened. So I'm sitting there waiting, aim lamps come by, they they fly by us, I'm blowing the horn at them. They fly by us and I jump out the bus yelling, hey, hey, over here, and they heard me. Because, like I said, it was warm. They had their windows down. And um, they turned around. And by that time, they couldn't see Torin because he was in front of me, in front of the bus. So they got out of the AM lamps. They walked around, and I showed them where he was. And that's when I really saw the damage they did to Torin. They uh, shot him pretty much in the nose and in the, in the ear from what I saw. It looked like uh, his ear. It looked like a bowl of soup with blood all in it. That's what it looked like, and I couldn't understand that at that time because I didn't know he was shot there. I could see the bullet in his nose, but I I couldn't see what caused his ear to be like that. But I don't think any man should be treated the way Torrin was treated. I was at work and ironically I get updates on my phone from Penn Live and I had been watching the story all morning about the body found at the Civil War Museum 
and um, but never, never in a million years did I dream anything. And um, I got the front, the receptionist called from up front um, at our front office. I work in a warehouse. And um, she said that I had visitors. And I didn't believe her at first. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And then I started to think that maybe it was my, my sister and my niece because they, they randomly pop in sometimes. Um, or just my sister, you know, so who has sometimes brings me coffee or, or, you know, a donut or things like that. So I was beginning to think, well, maybe it was, it was, you know, one of them. Um, so I kind of left my desk and I had it up front and I went in and there was gentlemen standing in the front office and they asked me my name and I told them and, um, they said, you know, we need to talk to you, but our conference room at the time was being, was being used. Um, so we just all kind of stood there awkwardly um, until the conference room cleaned out and, um, or cleared out. And then we went into the conference room and they, you know, they asked me um, if I had talked to Torrin at all that morning. And I said, no. Um, and I, I didn't even, as awful as it sounds, um, I didn't even know if he was home. And when they asked me if I had talked to him at that point, I didn't even, I didn't even realize that he wasn't home. And, and then when I said that I didn't know that I hadn't talked to him is when they, they told me about what happened. And... <gasps> And then I made the connection and I said, he's the body you found at the Civil War Museum. And they confirmed that. And I think I just went into shock. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to, what to feel. I didn't, I didn't get emotional. I just felt numb. I mean, when they say that, you feel numb. You feel numb. You don't know how to react. And I, I just, it just seemed unreal. And I just kept thinking they have it wrong. They have it wrong. Let's dance and stop. For the best, but expecting the worst Are you gonna drop the bomb now? Let us die young and let us live forever We don't have the power, but we never say never Sitting in a sandpit, life is a short trip The music's for the sad man Can you imagine when this race is won? Turn our golden faces into the sun Praising our leaders, we're getting in tune The music's played by the madman Forever young, I wanna be forever young Do you really wanna live forever, forever? Well, never Forever young, I wanna be forever young Do you Forever, forever. 
Like, why would you do this to him? Like, what, what possessed you to, to kill him? You know, um, I think, I think, my biggest question to Tyrese would be like, why, out of everybody, why would you pick Torn to set up? You know, he was your friend. He did everything for him. You know, at some point, and just why would you why would you choose him like why would you even put him in that situation I think when it all happened I was that was my biggest I was more angry at him than I was at any anybody because he put him in that situation and if he wouldn't have put him in that situation it may not have happened the way that it did um, Torrance in heaven and he's not hurting anymore but you just left a world of hurt behind so even though you didn't, you think you solved it by, by killing him, you ended up hurting everybody else. And they hurt themselves. They, they've robbed themselves of an entire life. I mean, they're never going to be able to live freely. If I could look at him one more time and say anything, I think I'd just tell him how proud I was of him, even though I still mothered him so that I was trying to encourage him to to still be a better person. I would still tell him that I was proud of him because I don't think I told him that enough. Even though he knew it, I didn't tell him enough. And I think I'd probably, I'd probably hug him more because he didn't like to be hugged as much as he got older. So I would definitely tell him how much I love him of how much he, how important he was to people that I never realized. I've said from the beginning, Heather, um, I don't know how she does it. As a mom, I couldn't even imagine losing any of my children and then to sit back and, and go through what she went through and still is. Um, I'm just so sorry, and I know sorry's not going to change anything, but... I just hope at some point she can find peace in this, and um, they can continue to grow as a family, and all this hurt and, and pain. At some point it's hard to think, but it will turn to peace and happiness and the memories will overtake the pain of what everyone's experiencing and uh, I just my heart constantly goes out to Heather I just I, it's I don't know how she does it when she needs to be she can be strong um, as Allie said you know she's putting everybody feelings first but when it's like us or when it's like you know we go to bed you know or when she, you know in the mornings it's just like when it's just her or just us it's you know she, that's when you know she unloads and she gets really upset and angry you know angry at everything you know angry at herself for not knowing where he was that night angry at you know these people for doing this to us for him to him to his family um but like, you know, she, you know, puts her mom pants on and, you know, f and does what she can for these, you know, her girls. She's been good. Like, um, she doesn't cry. She tries not to cry in front of us and like show her emotions because she tries to be strong for all of us. Like, we, some days she like comes home. You can tell that she was crying in the car on the way home because her nose would be red. But I've don't say anything because that's her own time and yeah she's just been she's been very strong and I know she's hurting. I hope that one day I'm half mom that she is 
to us and she raised us really really strong and she really really tried to protect us in any way possible and she wanted us to follow our dreams and Torn was her little boy and she wanted him to follow his dreams. Uh, my grandson was a very funny, very loving, very smart and talented young man. <laughs> Don't tell him that I'm sorry. <laughs> that he was one of the realest on my team. <laughs> that I would do anything to have him back. I had a chance to talk to him one more time. I tell him I love him and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there for him that day. And I couldn't have saved him or, you know, that we didn't really get to, you know, be around each other much before he passed away. So I just, you know, let him know that I really love him and I'm sorry that I had that he had to go like that. But he lived an awesome life and, you know, he touched many other people's lives, including mine. He kind of, you know, he never really wanted, he just always wanted anybody to like him, regardless if it was a friendship or not. It was always, he just wanted everybody to just like him and accept him. He is a caring person. He was always all ears whenever you needed something. You could go to Torn even if you didn't know him. That's how I met him. We went, I went to him talking to him about situations and he was just all ears and always had good feedback. I wish that someone can benefit from this awful, awful, awful situation. That you doing this documentary helps another's life. It shines a light on what is going on in society, the ills of society, between the gun violence and, bu I mean, bullying as well, of course, and that children can just be children and teenagers can just be teenagers without the fear of being a regular kid, hanging out with your friends and dying. That, that's, that shouldn't happen. And so I hope that Heather gets that gets that peace because this and Torn's death could potentially help somebody else and or bring peace to another family like that's what I hope she gets out of it more than anything what I'd like to see come out of this film is something that can help prevent this from happening to somebody else um, ultimately we don't want to see Torn's death um, mean nothing so if some politician some congressman can introduce even a bill in Torrin's name to help prevent these kind of things from happening to anyone else. Because now that you've been in this situation, you see what it's like. Whenever you see someone get shot or someone be murdered, you just know what these families are going through. And it changes your whole mindset because now you're thinking about that family and you know that family is never going to be the same. And just to pray for them and to feel how they're grieving, it's something that shouldn't be happening. So if this film can help save one life, hopefully it can save many, many more, that would be incredible. But that is for sure something I want to see come out of this film is to see some kind of action from Congress or some politician to help stop this from happening again.